we are there be patient and wait. We must say that we cannot be patient. If we do not get meaningful legislation out of this Congress, we will march through the South, through the streets of Jackson, through the streets of Danville, through the streets of Cambridge, through the streets of Birmingham. But we will march with the spirit of love and with the spirit of dignity that we have shown here today. That was future Congressman John Lewis calling for good trouble. But good trouble was more than just a phrase. It was a strategy. Joining us now, best-selling author and Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Tom Ricks. This morning, we begin a week-long residency for his new book entitled Waging a Good War, a military history of the civil rights movement, 1954 to 1968. And let me just say, Tom is also growing. The last time <laughs> uh, we had him here for a, a residency, uh, his wife was making him stay up in the attic That's to talk right. to us. <laughs> now now we got him out. Yay. We got him out in, in a studio in Congratulations Washington. Congratulations on the DC. book. Uh, Tom, obviously, I uh, loved your last book. This one is fantastic. So excited about it. Talk about your inspiration for writing it. Well, thank you for having me on. It's actually great to be released into the world again. Uh, and I got to say, this book fits right into the themes you've been talking about this morning. Nonviolent social change. Um, a real contrast to both Donald Trump's remarks and to Vladimir Putin's invasion of Ukraine. That said, the civil rights movement, uh, from the get-go, was quite militant, uh, quite focused in its approach organized, uh, deeply committed to preparation, to thoughtful training, to rehearsals, and extremely good at strategy. In fact, I think the civil rights movement probably was better at strategy, making strategy and implementing it, than the U.S. military is. But you That's mentioned my wife. Hats off mm -hmm. here. The inspiration uh, for this in many ways was my wife, who was president of high school friends of SNCC in Washington, D.C. Uh, in the 1960s, um, among other things, picked up John Lewis when he came to the uh, train station to Washington and demanded to be taken to McDonald's. Uh, she sure. drove him off, off to McDonald's. I was kind of, wow. all my life, I've been hearing from her, all our married life, uh, she's, you know, we'd be riding in the car, listening to NPR, and she said, oh, you know, I dated that guy once, or I knew I knew that person, or, boy, I thought that guy went crazy. He seems to be okay now. And I was reading the histories of the civil rights movement, kind of understanding some of the people she knew, the people she'd worked with, and it struck me, boy, these people went through a war in the United States, and they succeeded because of this military-like organization they had. In the book, you discuss the training program that civil rights activists went through, organized by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And you write uh, this, King's organization, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, established a school in Dorchester, Georgia, for recruiting and training. These recruits were invited to the school for week-long courses where they learned how to hold a meeting, make a long-distance phone call, or to talk to a hostile white sheriff. Then they went back to their communities to make what the movement called good trouble. Once the basic principles had been imparted, the volunteers would begin to practice. In the evening sessions, they sat at long tables pretending they were at lunch counters, while other students played the role of harassing whites. C.T. Vivian, who became a close associate of King, recalled that we actually poured coffee on people and kicked chairs out from under them. Students learn how to take the blows, not just physically, but mentally, so they could endure being spit on and still respond with some sense of dignity. And Reverend Al, that, that was the balance, such a difficult balance that you were talking about. No, uh, you know, Wyatt T. Walker, uh, who died a couple of years ago, was the first chairman of the board when I started National Action Network 31 years ago. And he would tell me about these sessions. Uh, my beat coming out of the North, I didn't know any of it, and I was a generation behind them. And he said, no, we practiced uh, being spat at. We practiced having 
coffee poured on us. We practiced how we would deal with hostility because we had to be the moral counterpoint to that. And Tom, I think you could tell more than, than I could. Uh, this was almost like going to boot camp, and they would discipline them if you got out of line, which is Hosea Williams was the one that gave me the medallion everybody teases me about. But I used to wear that because I felt I was a soldier in the Army after they gave me these stories. Mm -hmm. But they took it very seriously, like they were going into the armed forces. They were going into, if, if for lack of a better term, our disarmed forces to disarm mm -hmm. racism in America. They really had a sense of discipline and dignity. What I love is the, in the training they got, you know, they were trained in sit-ins not to respond, not even to turn and look at the person, uh, but also to control that impulse to fight or flee and to do neither. Uh, they were specifically trained, if somebody spat in your face, ask them for a handkerchief. And sometimes what would happen is a person would reach and then say, hell no. But for <laughs> one moment... They had reached and touched the human being attacking them. Mm. And the more you could do that, the more you had the discipline to stay on message and reach out, the, the better off you were and ultimately the better off they were. One thing I like about the Birmingham campaign is at the end of the Birmingham campaign, after King and Fred Shuttlesworth, a great fighter, had won integration of downtown restaurants, they would call ahead and say, look, uh, we're going to have some people come in for lunch tomorrow. What time is convenient for you? This does a couple of things. First, it informs them in a polite way, we're coming. But also, it trains the white opposition. The last form of training was to actually train your former enemy how to live with you in an integrated world. The new book is titled Waging a Good War, A Military History of the Civil Rights Movement, 1954 to 1968. Tom Ricks, thank you. We'll have more on the book throughout the week. We really appreciate it.